just to be the podcast next to you. Welcome to <laughs> Small Town Film Ghosts. Or I'm Jared Resick. Uh, my name's Todd Leiser. I'm Julie Furness. Wait, are we still are we still Small Town Film Ghosts? Is that our well, fucking are name? Are we? <laughs> we, we? We are until someone says we're not. No, okay, okay. Yes, okay. So we're, yep. yeah, we're, we are the Small Town Ghosts. We are the Small Town Film Ghosts. We occupy this space that <laughs> yeah. may be called something else, but we ourselves, we yeah. are the small town film ghosts. <laughs> Even if the name of this podcast changes, we will still be the small town film ghosts. Yes, exactly. Yeah. We we, we, we made an investment, and yes. so yeah. we want to pay off. Yeah. So, hey, how are you guys this morning? I'm a little messed up. Well, yeah, because of the movie that we watched? Yeah. Yeah. We watched a way crazy movie. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, I like writing one sentence reviews for movies on Letterboxd, and my one sentence review for this movie was if I wanted to hear about this kind of shit, I would answer the phone calls from my estranged father. <laughs> uh, and I feel like that kind of covered all of it. There, there definitely is oh, a boy. a slippery slope into conspiracy theories. Dude, it's is it that slippery? It just seems like a giant slope covered in nails and yeah, poo. Yeah. Okay, okay, so t- to back up, today we are talking about A Glitch in the Matrix. Yes. Uh, this movie just came out at Sundance this year, uh, 2021. It, it, it just, just premiered. I remember reading a couple of reviews maybe yeah, a yeah. month ago. Yeah, yeah, a lot of people talking about it. Oh, yeah, it was, it was kind of like one of the, one of the lightning rods of the festival. Yep. Um, and, and maybe because it was such a lightning rod, maybe that that's why it got such a quick release. Uh-huh. Um, Fun yeah. fact, Go the director of this movie... His first film, which was entitled Room 237, which is a documentary about all of the conspiracies, the conspiracy theories that came out of the movie The Shining. I've heard about the movie, never seen it. Yeah, we showed that here at Tin Pan Theater, and up until that point, it was the least in- least attended movie we've ever had. I'm going to say the entire two weeks we had it, we showed it to ten people. When I, when I think of Room 30, this 237, it's one of those movies that for a couple of years was just like Netflix was really trying to get me to watch Dude, yeah. forever. And I was like, I don't think I'm interested in this movie. Yeah. It's it's definitely that kind of movie that just I feel like a lot of people probably saw on Netflix because they were like, oh, I trust Netflix's algorithms to recommend me stuff. Sure, sure. But I don't know if it was really that good. Yeah. It's I like I sometimes feel like I want to say to Netflix, I want to say like, shut up, algorithm, you're drunk. Because it's always like, hey. This is what I recommended for you. And it's like, hey, hey based on all the stuff you watched earlier, <laughs> just watch this other thing. Hey, you watched Bridgerton. Do you want to watch three Van Damme movies? <laughs> also, no. all, all the other people in America are watching these movies, so you should too, yeah. by the way. Oh, great. The, the, the Wink Saga is available. Awesome. And if you forgot about Tiger King, you should totally watch it again. Yeah, it's always time for Tiger King. Oh, always. Yeah. That, hey, Tiger P- please, King. Please keep sub- subscribing to us because there are other streaming services now. We need you to keep subscribing, yeah. please. <laughs> I'm alone. It's okay, Netflix. So, we'll hold you. Yeah, so Rodney Ash- Asher, is that yeah. how you say it? So did a lot of TV. Mm-hmm. Um but he is definitely a documentarian and we should talk about the aesthetic of the film yeah. as well. Um, he calls it, he calls it subjective documentary. Subjective documentary. Yeah. Yes. And a glitch in the matrix. How would we describe it? You said your one liner Todd. Uh, yeah. I would say, well, <clears throat> before you even watch the movie, it, it, the movie presents itself as, a documentary exploring the idea of simulation theory, this idea of are we living in a simulation? The It, 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 it presents itself as an exploration of that topic. Right. Um, I don't think, though, my, so my, my, my brief take is that I don't think this is a movie really about... It, it doesn't make an argument one way or the other. It's more a movie about internet culture and the way that we are obsessed with this idea right. rather than the idea itself. Right. right. Um, and, 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 and right away, I'll, I'll say, like, I think this movie is worth watching, but I think it is worth watching because, because the ideas are fascinating. And I think as humans, we definitely, we like to dig into these ideas. Right, right. But there's no, con- there's, you shouldn't go into it expecting a conclusion at the end, or you shouldn't go into this movie expecting that there is. There's not even a powerful argument for it. Well, no, yeah, yeah, yeah. and it's, it's almost too much. 
it's right. too much because right. you're talking about um, a modern hypothesis that has ancient roots. You know, so they right. do a little history there. They talk. They introduce an author who's been writing about this. So um, I, I can I. I'm sorry. I don't mean to interrupt. I read. Okay. So I read Philip K. Dick's exe- exegesis. Ex- exegesis. Um, yeah, I, I do want to say I'm a big fan of Phil K. Dick. Like as a teenager, like he was one of like the first big writers I really got yeah. into. So ha- having him be like one of the main yeah. topics in this movie really, really fascinating. It really, yeah. it really is. He's kind of the his writings are the backbone of the movie. But his exegesis was a uh, compilation of the thousands and thousands of pages he left after his death about the religious slash. The, the undertones and themes of his writing, or no, 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 oh, no, no. It's all it's all based on the mental breakdown that he had. It's That's all right. of his notes about what he saw as seeing outside of our reality. Okay. Um, and the amazing author Jonathan Lethem is one of the people that kind of combined it and, and made it. So sorry, the, the, just from what you were saying, the author that they interviewed, I read that book that he okay. wrote. Okay. And what made you pick up that book? Because Were you okay? So let's just like let's just get into it, okay? Yeah, yeah, because yeah. W- there's so many things going on here, okay? Right. We're talking about alternate reality. We're talking about video games. We're talking right. about science fiction. Right. We're right. talking about how does this the Matrix obviously, okay? Yeah, yeah, and the, the movie the itself. Matrix. When the Matrix, mm-hmm. you know, came out, and like you said, you walked out of the theater. I walked out of the theater going, okay. I need to see this again. Right. How many times did I see The Matrix? Probably 20 times. Mm. Okay. It's, it's a movie that is in my bones. Like mm-hmm. I, I, Absolutely. I, I, I put The Matrix along with like Jurassic Park and Star Wars. Yeah. Totally. Movies, movies I've seen just thousands of times. Absolutely. Yeah. You like love science fiction. You love science fiction. Mm-hmm. Okay. So how how is it? Because this movie really, really roughed me up in some areas because I just hadn't, my brain hadn't gone mm-hmm. there yet. Right. Well, I think one of the great ways that this movie starts is it, it, it starts with um, a Philip K. Dick talk that he did in, in France and the movie can continually cuts back to, to, to sort of frame, frame the movie itself. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it talks about how Philip K. Dick was interested not only in science fiction, but religion and philosophy and, and, and all these things. Right. And I do think the, a big reason I think why this movie is enjoyable is because it is a collection of all of these old ideas from Plato's Cave to Descartes mm-hmm. that I do think are, are, are absolutely great ideas to explore as a human. Mm-hmm. It's, we, we, we are, it's why we, we you know, have philosophy classes in college and why we have religion and, and why we are drawn to drug experiences because these are very deep human questions that we're always drawn to. And so I think the movie is a great experience just to sort of get all of those together and um, explore and, re- and, and, and and be reminded of, oh yeah, like just we as humans, we are fascinated by this topic and it yeah. is it is worth yeah. worth going into. Um, but again, I don't think you should expect that the movie is saying like, we are living in a simulation or right, yeah, you shouldn't definitely. expect some sort of definite thesis or oh, conclusion. Oh, absolutely. It's, it's surprisingly I mean, more neutral than I actually expected. It yeah. to be you know I, it's, it's it's more of a movie about why are we obsessed with this why right. are we obsessed right. with this and this could be a doctoral thesis yeah for, oh yeah for the ages you know it kind of um, feels like one it, it does it mm-hmm. feels like someone's thesis just you know splattered across the screen there and i it was it was it was a lot for me to take in because yeah you know I mean, and I do want to ask you guys because you are sci- sci-fi nerds. I mean, I'm I am too, but not to the extent. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, I want to know. You know, they kept cutting to like Wizard of Oz, and, right? Um, right. Blade Runner, and you know, what <laughs> what were some other films they could have, you know, the, the, spliced in there? The, there were definitely most of the movie references that they would often make or, or cut to. In my own head, I I I really like breaking down all the different subgenres of science fiction movies right right um and like usually like i I feel like space movies are their own thing and then i think simulated reality movies are their own thing and so a lot Mm -hmm. of what they're cutting to are these movies that i i describe as the simulated reality movies 13th 13th floor floor, the matrix inception um 
uh, Johnny Mnemonic. Johnny Mnemonic. Yeah. There's there, there there's 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 definitely a lot of that, and yeah. it it is an old science fiction concept. There's, there's a lot of fodder mm. that sci-fi writers, you know, as far as back as um, Ray Bradbury or you know you know Isaac Asimov, mm -hmm. the writers of that classic science fiction era from like the 50s and 60s. That this idea of a simulated reality has always been a fascinating topic in science yeah, fiction. Yeah. Um, Half of Harlan Ellison's stories are about simulated reality. Totally, totally, yeah. And, and there's, there's even I, I almost feel like cyberpunk is its own thing, but there's definitely a lot of overlap between yeah, yeah. cyberpunk and simulated yeah. reality a, a lot of so times. So the the um the interviewees, the ones that were you know the main let's just say characters, yeah. the, the, the the main talking heads, the main talking heads, yeah. so they were in. Were they hiding themselves? That's a good. I wanted were to they, I wanted to ask that question to yeah, you guys as well. So. They, so the main people that are the main, because the whole movie, when there are talking heads, not all of them are given these animated avatars. Only the ones that are like, I believe we are in a simulation. Those are the ones that got animated. And in a way, on in on one hand, I question whether the interviewees were like. I don't want you to show my face and and the filmmaker was like then we're going to animate you or whether he did it in post production because in a way it, it kind because they were animated and they were like like one of the uh one of the talking heads was like this big fat green troll looking thing yes. with like a with a helmet with a helmet that kept and breathing hard and going and like, like smoke oh. pot or something at one point you know and yeah I was like, and so <laughs> that, that made me wonder like are you trying to undermine what they're saying by giving them these ridiculous avatars because it did it always did every time it cut to a card like a video game character mm -hmm. Which I again thematically I guess it works, but in the reality of a cinematic experience, it undersold everything that they were trying to say. Yeah. But but again, the to me, those talking heads with those people was were always like the, the way that those people talked to us was that us living in a simulation was like. A, a bygone theory like like it was the prevailing theory so everyone should be accepting it none of them ever really tried to get into it too much about like i i guess like I, why i felt like there'd be more why the like, yeah yeah because there's yeah sure some of them have like anecdotal stories about i walked out of a movie and i felt like everything was a simulation or little things like that but I, ex I guess I expected more people to talk about the basis of the theory well, and why, why people believe it. The, the, the talking heads with the, um, the PhDs right. and the right. scientists and the writers, they juxtaposed those and it was like, here's what this weirdo thinks, right. but here's the real study. Right. Weirdo, real. Right. Weirdo gets yeah. paid to do this. But do you, you, know? think, that, like, do you think that's what the... The, the way that the film was structured and made, do you think that was the purpose of, I, I, of at, it? At one point, because when they were like the toad dude, whatever he was, like yeah. the troll, yeah. space troll guy, I yeah, don't know. Yeah. When he was talking about um, space troll when he perfect. played video games for two years yeah. straight, yeah. I Literally was like, straight. I know people like that. And I know people who had to go to rehab Right, because of World of Warcraft. I, I, and remember, I, I remember her in college. Yeah, and I will tell you that that is real. It's oh yeah, yeah. very real. My and brother, my brother, uh, lost his scholarship to college because he couldn't he couldn't stop playing video games and quit going to class. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. what I, you guys can speak to more of that because mm -hmm. I have uh, seen it firsthand, but I'm not. How does that work? How how does that happen? Well, well, your your description, Jared, of all these talking heads. Again, that's that's the reason why I think this movie is about internet culture and not about simulation theory. Oh, it's, right. It's about how it, it's more of a fascinating look at the way that all these people on the internet talk about these things, like the Mandela effect, right. and you know, right, right. Uh, and, and 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 all these people who I bet a lot of them really like talking about Elon Musk because they just like the internet creates this space where people can go present ideas and i think there is there 
because of the, the way that the movie presents its ideas, there there is an interesting opportunity for viewers to, after the movie's done, think of, think about the way that the way that the internet does create this space where we we are talking about ideas like this, but there's no way for often ideas to actually be substantiated or a way that for sure. ideas to actually be credited. Mm -hmm. And you could take this in direction of like, this is the reason why we are in the world we are in today where people believe conspiracy theories and, and, and the reason why, yeah, you know, there are echo chambers on the internet. This movie is a fascinating look at it. It doesn't, the movie doesn't actually ever really take a, again, a stance necessarily. Right. But right. it just sort of, it sort of says, hey, this is the way people talk about this stuff on the internet. Isn't that fascinating? Right, yeah, right. Like, like, let's take the Matrix, you know? Yeah. And I was fascinated by, it was that haunting story about the guy who, spoiler alert, murders his parents. Right. And the music they were playing behind that when he was talking about it mm -hmm. and then talking about going up to his room, looking at his poster, you know, pictures of his, his outfit that he wore. He talked about the black trench coat, the trench the, coat, the yeah. boots, the abuse, the bullying, the, all of yeah. it. And it's like, okay, we're really, and then when they talked about the matrix defense and how mm -hmm. that is a real thing. Yeah, and I yeah. looked it up because yeah. I was like, okay, yep. these are people who, really truly believe they are in an alternate universe mm -hmm. and we are computers mm -hmm. and everything is planned. Right. Right. And that is why you see the same numbers every day. Right. Same time, same place. Okay. And since I will tell you, because this is why this freaked me out so much is because since nine 11, which really did a number on me personally, right. um, I went to New York after that happened. I went to Ground Zero. I saw things I shouldn't have seen. And right. since then, I have seen 9-11, the numbers 9-11, mm -hmm. many, many, many times. Right. Is that post-traumatic stress disorder or am I a computer? Right. And again, right. I, I think the the fascination with that is a, is a very human fascination. Um, I think the the... The fact that we are often contextualizing that fascination through the idea of a simulation is a, is a is a modern concept, but that fascination with synchronicity is something that goes back to ancient Rome and, okay. and right. the beginnings of human civilization. Okay. Um, yeah, that's which, why we've had the term déjà vu for so long. Totally, yeah. totally. Yeah, um, yeah, and 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 also too, like the way that the movie also starts with not only talking about Philip K. Dick's interest with religion but also the fact that his uh, the way that he wrote the exogenesis and his breakdown was from uh, a surgery to get his teeth removed right and so right. that also just made me think about the way that humans are often drawn to hallucinogenic drug experiences right well i was gonna right. say Again. was he a drug user when he wrote yeah his books yeah, yeah. Or... scanner darkly is about yeah yeah it's about war. okay he wrote scanner darkly yeah. okay under okay, the okay right yeah. under the influence yeah. okay that's what i thought yeah. um the reason i read the how do you how do you say it again todd Ex exegesis Ex i don't know how to say it's it, hard actually. to say it's a word maybe something yeah like that. the the reason i read it was because i knew philip k dick did not have a good last 10 plus years of his life Mm -hmm. um he became very paranoid he became very shut in like his it was a nightmare and so a lot of that a lot of that book is those writings and those ramblings that he did over the over that last decade and it was him trying to make sense of the religious iconography that was constantly popping into his head that he had no control over mm -hmm. okay. um but i mean half that book, and it's like a seven or eight hundred page book and yeah, i'd say yeah, almost yeah. half of it is like symbols and drawings and stuff that that in in charts and just weird iconography that he drew himself oh. so like you 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 read it and then it really makes it's uh it's so hard to read because it a it's legitimately hard to read because it's the ramblings of someone yeah, losing it, their mind yeah uh who is probably undiagnosed schizophrenic probably but it also makes looking back at his older work like uh like skinner darkly like uh do we android stream of lecture sheep yep it makes going back to those books harder because you know 
That makes sense. By the time he died, he believed that his mind was a window to a reality that all those books really happened. Sure. And then films. Sure. I mean, after that, I mean, yeah. it's saying yeah, that yeah. Blade Runner was heavily mm. influenced by his writing. Oh yeah, no, it's, Minor- it's based on. It is an adaptation. Based on adaptation. Uh, Minority Report. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, that's. Yeah. I, and I now I know that's why they were showing those clips yeah, of those yeah. films. Those are all Total Recalls based like, on Like Total K. Recall, yeah, like yeah. you know, had uh, and Hollywood got obsessed with Philip K. Dick stories for for a while. Yeah, and for, the, for a while. The funny thing is that they never adapted them faithfully. It was, it not was, one it was time. Always just not like one time. this idea is cool. We're gonna take it. I think that's an injustice to him. Really, yeah, I mean, yeah, it might have been. Um, I think he would have liked. Too much, but... I think he would have liked the Man in the High Castle TV show. Mm. I think he would have been okay with that one. But Scanner Darkly was Scanner was Darkly good. was pretty awesome. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I mean, if you watch like Paycheck, the Ben Affleck oh, yeah. John oh, yeah. Woo movie, like there is not there's like barely a kernel of yeah. Philip K. Dick's yeah. story in that movie. So he you died know. pretty young. He, he did, yeah, he um, did. Yeah. I want to say. He was 53, right? was he, 50s, yeah. um, so I don't know how, how he died, but I mean, yeah, he wouldn't have been able to, uh, to see any of this. He yeah. got way more popular after he died. Oh yeah, yeah de- de- definitely, life. definitely not who became more popular. Um, so let's do some last thoughts on Glitch in the Matrix. Um, I, I, I do think that people should see this movie. I, I do think it's fascinating. Again, don't expect a real uh, argument that we are living in a simulated reality from this movie. Yeah, uh, yeah. Because I, I think the movie is more fascinating thinking about the way that this is a concept that has fascinated humans for the entirety of human civilization. Yeah, I think yeah. that's really what this movie br- brings out most. I think you said it, you know, just perfectly, really. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot going on there, and this is a very specific audience. Again, a festival film. Very much so. You get to sure. Sundance, you know, and you get to where you, where you see a documentary. Yeah. You begin your year this way. You're like, okay, awesome festival yeah. film. I can move on with my life, you right. know. Because right. <laughs> um, it's haunting. It really yeah, is it haunting. Is. And it then, is. you know, I when I watch stuff like this, I go down rabbit holes, you mm. know. And sometimes those rabbit holes aren't pleasant. No. Um, mm. And I actually, you know, I slept pretty well. But, you know, I woke up going, oh, my God, what happened last night? Yeah. yeah. So. It's, this, I... Luckily, I was really familiar with those with that director's other two films. Um, his second movie, Nightmare. The whole movie is just about people who suffer from terrifying uh, sleep paralysis. Oh, I've seen that movie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've seen that that's, movie. Uh, that's the whole movie. Is this people telling their nightmares? Yeah, yeah. That's the whole movie. Stories, yeah. Um, so I his, kinda, his style is definitely one of just like let's have people tell their own experiences. Yeah, yeah. I feel like I I really liked Glitch in the Matrix, and for it being an hour forty or whatever, it rocketed by it almost felt like a short to me for some reason Mm -hmm. but um i almost feel like it would have been stronger had the filmmaker taken not necessarily a stance but had it have more of a viewpoint is there a stance though i i i just it it just it felt like scenes of random information i don't think there could be closure on that though there, but there could be a center to your documentary. Like there could be, there could be, not even, not even an objective viewpoint, just a viewpoint. A view. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. Would have would have helped for me, because by you're right. By the end, I was left with nothing but feelings, and the movie gave me no way to process any of them at all. I absolutely recommend it to people, especially this movie is perfect. For people dealing with loved ones that are suffering from QAnon. Yeah, that's what, that's what I thought this you were going to say. This is the perfect documentary to watch mm-hmm. because it's literally like this is how someone existing in their own parallel reality interacts with the world. And the, and like for me, the empathy of this film was extreme. Like Like – you listen to this guy who murdered his parents. You hear him talk for like a half an hour before mm-hmm. you find out that he killed his parents. Mm-hmm. Pretty intelligently, too. Intelligently. You know? And then when he gets to the part where he kills his parents, he's like, I didn't want to do the Matrix defense. I wanted to die. I felt like I should be punished for what I did. So I pled guilty. And yeah. he was like, yeah, he could have gone one way because he would have ended up in an insane asylum, basically. Right, right. Or, right, you know, right. a mental facility yeah. for the rest of his life. And it would have. That probably would have killed him. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So 
Now, where can we find this movie to watch? Oh, yeah. Uh, if you go to the Virtual Tin Pan site, you can see all the movies that are currently playing through our website. Uh, if you go to TinPanTheater.com, the best way to do it is to click at the very top. There is the Virtual Tin Pan link. That's going to have everything that's available. If you scroll down, we don't always have everything that's available right down there. Also, if you go to our link tree, which you can go to linktr.ee dot ee slash Ben Film, you're going to see all the links to everything that's currently going on, including the virtual Tin Pan Theater, uh, tickets for Minari, the Ski Night Films, uh, the Ski Raffle tickets, how to donate. All it's all it's all, it's yeah. all there. Um, and yeah, you could either donate or become a member. Uh, also, the film festival is coming up in October. So, oh, have, you guys, have you guys started <laughs> screening movies for you? Not yet. Yeah. We'll get there. I don't yeah. want to think about it. Uh, oh, yeah, I don't want to <laughs> uh, yeah, so that's our discussion of A Glitch in the Matrix. Uh, we hope you will go and see it. Uh, yeah. we, we do think it, it's, it's worth watching. Absolutely. And again, if you watch it through our website, you will support us directly. We really, we really appreciate it. Directly. Yes. Directly. Directly. <laughs> okay, I think we're going to take a little bit of a break and yeah that sounds good we'll be right back i need a coup hey folks it's todd here i hope you enjoyed our discussion of a glitch in the matrix after the break you can hear the three of us talk about the cultural influence of the matrix in the last 20 years so the matrix the actual 1999 movie uh we're going to talk about that movie as well as the filmmaking career of the wachowskis so stick around if you want to watch the documentary A Glitch in the Matrix, it is available right now on the Virtual Tin Pan website. It's the same place as the rest of the movies we've been talking about. If you need a reminder, it's just going to be right there at the very top of TinPanTheater.com, the Virtual Tin Pan link. That is also where you can find uh, the film we're going to talk about next week. We will be discussing Two of Us, which is France's official entry for the Best International Film category at this year's Oscars. That movie is available to watch right now, so go for it. Next week is also going to be just Jared and myself talking about the movie. Uh, unfortunately, Julie won't be able to make it, so we'll see how just the two of us do. I'm sure it'll be great. Uh, we'll be talking about the movie as well as just modern queer cinema, um, and we'll you know bring in several themes. Um, I, I feel like there's a lot of French films that you know usually deal with gay characters, so this is... Uh, you know, kind of run of the mill. No, that, that's that's being glib. No, I, I'm I'm honestly looking forward to this movie and just you know talking about talking about queer cinema. Uh, other things to mention: Tin Pan is open for private rentals. We just had our first first couple of couple of rentals the last couple of days. Uh, I, I worked two days of that, and I think Jared did one, and it's been it's been great. We, they they've been going really well. So yeah, if you want to rent Tin Pan Theater for a private screening. Go ahead and do that. We've we've got it available on the website, and it's going to be right there at the at the very top, like like the virtual tin pan link. Uh, the other thing is, if you have not checked out the link tree, that is the best place to see what see everything that we have going on right now. That's going to be at l i n k t r dot e e slash bend film. And you can also find the link to that at the very top of our Instagram as well. Uh, we're going to work on actually making this link tree a little more easier to find. I know that it's kind of rough right now. Uh, it sh it we, We'll make this available to, to find on the Tin Pan Theater website soon enough. So uh, bear with us. But for now, you can go to that URL, which again is linktr.ee slash benfilm. And on that, you're going to see how you can find the Minari virtual screenings, uh, this new movie, Personhood, which is available to watch. That's also how you can rent the tin pan. You'll see the link for the Thursday and Friday night ski nights. Um, you'll also see the raffle for this, uh, the crow's feet skis that are still going on. If you want to win those skis, put in, a, put in a raffle ticket. And not a lot of people have done it. So honestly, if you want to get a pair of really nice skis from crow's feet, uh, you might still have a good chance of, of doing that. Uh, also, early bird submissions for the festival, uh, which again is going to happen this October 7th through the 17th. Uh, also, you'll see the link there, how to donate, uh, how to become a member if you want to, uh, everything. I could I could keep doing, going down the list, but I will save that for your own perusing. Uh, let's see, last thing to mention. Um, Oh, oh, there's a new movie coming out on the virtual website pretty soon, uh, MLK FBI, which is going to open up on Friday, February 26th. This is the documentary 
that really investigates how the FBI was surveilling Martin Luther King Jr. right up until his untimely death. And it's a very good documentary. I've, I've heard a lot of good press for this film. I'm really looking forward to it. Uh, and I think it's going to be a, a fascinating watch. That's going to open up again on Friday, February 26th. Uh, so look forward to it. It'll be easy to watch right there on the Virtual Tin Pan website. Um, I know a couple of our movies have been a little hard to find, like Minari, because they're doing th things a little different. But this movie, MLK FBI, is going to be right there on the Virtual site, like uh, Glitch in the Matrix and like, like Two of Us. Um, that's pretty much everything. Trying to keep it brief. I think I've been talking for a while, but you know how these things go. All right, everybody, uh, stick around. We're going to talk about the Matrix itself uh, and you know how it how it's been a big a big influence, especially on this movie, Glitch in the Matrix. And next week we'll be talking about two of us. Uh, all right. Thanks for listening, everybody, and uh, hope you enjoy the rest of the episode. Podcast. Dun, 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 dun. Podcast. Podcast. I can feel it coming in the air tonight. Podcast. Oh, podcast. <laughs> hey, everybody, oh, welcome back. Welcome back. My name's Todd Lizer. I'm Julie Furtis. And I am Phil Collins. Our oh, wait, no, 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 I'm Jared. I'm Jared. Re Sorry. Resident Ben film critic, <laughs> the movie critic, Phil and Collins. Phil, Phil, Phil Collins. <laughs> um... We, yeah, with my partner. Is that partner, a raincoat Peter you're wearing? Um, <laughs> sorry. Hey, hey, hey Phil Collins, what's your most recent <laughs> review on Ben Source for? Hey, I uh, the one you mean the one that'll be out way before this podcast comes out? Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, I don't know yet. It's the future. <laughs> but the one I just wrote was for the film A Glitch in the Matrix. Is it a simulation or is it an actual review? I know. <laughs> I simulated writing the review. What I did is while I was supposed to be writing it, I was actually uh, like looking at photos of ex-girlfriends on oh, Instagram. Okay. So, well. so anyway, so we're gonna all, we're, right? we're gonna talk about uh, stuff. <laughs> No, actually, no. We so so we want to have a, uh, a, a conversation. My own heart. I'm sorry. Can we just take a moment <laughs> and be sad for me? Hold on. Uh, there we go. Uh. We are continuing our discussion on a glitch in the matrix. Yeah. Uh, not the film. We are going to. <laughs> not the film. <laughs> we are done. Oh, we're not talking. Okay. We're done talking about the film. We yeah. are moving on to the subject of. The Matrix itself, the Matrix trilogy, now a fourth coming soon. -ish. Yeah, coming soon. Yeah. Um, 20, it's supposed. To, it wasn't. It, isn't it supposed to be 2021? At the, at the moment. And at the moment, we'll yeah. see. We'll see what happens. Um, but importantly, um, how this franchise, we'll call it, has influenced internet culture. Yeah. Because because right away, obviously, the documentary that we just talked about, Glitch in the Matrix, feels it is. That, that the Matrix movies are big enough that just putting that in the title will obviously communicate what the what the documentary is about. Um, so that the fact that the Matrix movies still hold such a right. pretty heavy cultural imp import to a lot of people. Right. Um, I mean, I, 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 I would definitely agree that those movies have made a big influence over the last 20 years as, I think, as, as movie fans for, for science fiction. Um, it has definitely... Um, there, there's, there, there's a lot to unpack both from the ways that the movie influenced science fiction, the way that, I mean, just like action movies totally changed after The Matrix. It really for did, sure. yeah. Absolutely. It didn't just influence what movies were about. It influenced how they were made, mm -hmm. how they were written, how they were shot. Like, mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. one of the one of the fascinating things is that that movie came out in, I think, April of 1999. Mm-hmm. Star Wars Episode One: The Phantom Menace comes out a month later in wow. in May, wow. um, and like at the time in the beginning of the year, you know, Star's the big one everyone's looking for. They're like, sure. also there's this weird movie where like lightning is crashing on the poster and people are in trench coats. Who knows what that's gonna be? And about. it's yeah. Keanu Reeves, and yeah. we're like, what? Yeah. Who's still like? For we're those like, of you, Bill is who in. Are... The Matrix. Yeah, yeah. He was not super cool at the time of the Matrix releasing. He, he was not looked at as an action star. Not at all. Yeah, he was yeah. doing. He was making some weird choices, but yeah. also just like out of the spotlight. He was um, in a 
band or maybe still in a band called dog star mm-hmm. oh, and they were touring and like doing yeah. playing these weird venues i don't know keanu was in a weird place and I, 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 keanu. Yeah. keanu is a different keanu than post mean keanu right, right. I, I, I do think also because he uh early in his career he lost his wife and daughter in a car crash he did. Uh, mm-hmm. and i think it was in the early 90s when that and happened. before that he lost his best friend river phoenix, river phoenix. That's um, right, that's as well right. so he's he's been you know the the sad sad story about keanu reeves is 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 tragic yeah but like um, yeah the, the the fact that when this movie came out uh it probably absolutely stole the thunder that was building up for star wars because suddenly this movie that came out of the blue was like whoa this is what an action movie can feel like right. and that was i'm sure something that Star Wars was not expecting to happen, no, and so no, then, no, and, then no. and then when people go and see Star Wars, they're like, "Oh, oh god, this is well." And and yeah. would you agree that um, I don't know? I'd have to look at box office totals for the Matrix for like opening weekend, you know. But right. would you say you know, you know, in weeks after that, it was like people were either seeing it for the first time and blown away, or they were coming back to see it because this was a film right. you had to see on the big screen. Yeah, this is yeah. not and something more than once. And, and more, more than, than once, once which yeah. I definitely did. And then several times, you know, when it came out on DVD, because yeah, yeah. we were still watching DVDs back then. Yeah. Right. Yep. So, I mean, this, this was definitely a movie that definitely got passed around on DVD. Cause that, that was how I first mm-hmm. saw it. It was just like friends being like, you got to see this movie. And like, I, yeah, I, I was admittedly nine years old in 1999, but still the, the, the fact that, that was that was how it spread. If you hadn't seen it at theaters, was just this people were sharing it around. Yeah, on, that was on, on, on I. DVD. I to this day don't know if I can think of a movie that had more word of mouth than The Matrix. Like that was literally all you heard about. It's yes. very fair. I out. had I. This was one of the last. Well, uh, sorry, one of the first films I saw after. Um, no, I'm sorry. First films I saw before graduating from college. So, you. um, and I saw everything on the big screen then. Mm-hmm. So to mm-hmm. me, this was a, this was a really, um, interesting memory in so many ways, but just watching that one and watching over the years and not just matrix two and matrix three influence, but the influence it has had, um, in the past 20 plus mm-hmm. years yeah, it, on. It's interesting actually watching the Wachowskis' career because obviously they were inspired by comic books, anime, mm. um, just the, Japanese uh, culture. Yeah, in Japanese general. culture, mm. Hong Kong action movies. You yeah. know what? What wire wire stunt work? Mm. Um, and like they, you know, pretty amazingly were able to pull all these very disparate influences together in in this great film. Mm-hmm. And obviously, once the studio was like, okay, now you can keep on making movies in this world. They obviously took that opportunity, but then even once they finished the trilogy, then I would say that their blank check movie was Speed Racer, yeah, which is yeah. an example of just because of all the goodwill and clout they built up on the success of The Matrix, they were able to make whatever they want. Like I don't think there was any public appetite for a Speed Racer movie. Not the Wachowskis like did it just because they could. And yeah. Because they could. Mm-hmm. And if you watch the trailer, you're like, oh, my God, I've got to see this. Right. right and then you right. saw it and you're like, oh, no, why did yeah, I see I, this? I think Speed Racer is an all like a super classic. Like, okay. I, I think it's super misunderstood. Okay. I mean, think, they, uh, they are still extremely good filmmakers. Yeah. Yeah. Even the, because, I do, however, think that Jupiter Ascending is a giant pile of crap. OK. Um, I, mean, I mean, that's a funny thing, because like. Okay, I, admittedly, I've not seen Jupiter Ascending, uh-huh. but I know a lot of people who say, like, yeah, it's weird. It's stupid, but it's. But like, I think that movie speaks to a certain type of person. It's it's pure it's pure in mm-hmm. what it is. Mm-hmm. So like, but Eddie Redmayne, I've I've heard that Eddie Redmayne is the only only one who knows what movie he's in. <laughs> but 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 because of that, you're you're absolutely right. But because of that, because nobody else is in his movie, mm-hmm. he looks like the one who fucks up that whole movie <laughs> because his performance is like like he's doing Gary Oldman. From, uh, from, from from Fifth Element, like oh, right. he's yeah, playing yeah, yeah. that big, and or, or maybe Gary Oldman in, in the professional, like yeah, that kind yeah, of... like a combination. But Channing Tatum is like trying to seriously convey the performance of a guy that's half man and half dog. Yeah, yeah. And you're like, the, no, no, you no. needed to put a little camp yeah, in this, no. and you didn't do it. Yeah, but uh, obviously, I think Jupiter Ascending. I remember reading a headline when that movie was coming out, and someone said, "It's kind of crazy that." 
the Wachowskis are still being given the green light to chase whatever bonkers ideas they want. Yeah, whatever. And like, I'm happy to see the Wachowskis make stuff that might fail, but like, if they if they keep getting the chances to make their weird ideas, I want to live in that world where we keep seeing stuff from the Wachowskis. I mean, I think Cloud Atlas is the like top in the top ten of the best movies of the century by far. I'm currently reading the book because I want to. I want. I I wanted to read the book before I finally saw the movie. Yeah, yeah. Um, But I have so many friends who count Cloud Atlas as just such an important movie. It's so important. Like it's incredibly important, and it's 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 challenging because it's edited in such a way that like you have to put in the work. You really have to pay attention to every minute of this three plus hour movie. Yeah. So here's a list of how the matrix has um, really influenced filmmaking. Um, Mm -hmm. And let's just go around um, because they definitely went against mainstream. Um, You know, they talk about how um, black people have, basically have been erased from science fiction, Mm -hmm. you know, mostly Mm -hmm. up until then. Right. Um, Because we have, they're extremely interested in bringing uh, actors and people who have been traditionally erased by the Hollywood system and bring them to the forefront. Right. Bring them to the forefront and also in science fiction. Right. Because that's what Mm -hmm. that's what this is. And you can look at Neo as like the white savior if you want to, but at the same time, Neo wouldn't be shit without Morpheus. Mm -hmm. So ultimately he's kind of the, like, if 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 he's the son, Morpheus is the father, sure. and then the Holy Ghost would be like Trinity, maybe. Oh, yeah. look at that name! Look at her name! <laughs> wait, wait, are are there religious influences in the Matrix? Uh, I never, I never caught yeah, that. You never, yeah, isn't that wait, amazing? Oh is is the Matrix a Christ story? I didn't remember. Oh, that. oh my gosh! Like like in the end, where his arms are literally out. The and one, they yeah, form a in, cross, yeah, yeah, the the one, the yeah, chosen yeah. one, the chosen one, yeah, the one, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and of course, a film like we already mentioned, um, filmmaking, um, mm-hmm. the way filmmaking has has changed, the whole you know slow mo action scenes right, right. were so big after that, right? Yeah. Um, oh yeah, yeah. And you know the close ups on the on bullets, yeah, you know, gun bullets yeah, yeah, and yeah, close ups yeah. on you know, I mean all of those, those just like went crazy after that. It um, also it just made being uh, like a high concept movie popular again mm-hmm. like if you had a bonkers ass plot that people would go whoa halfway through you were going to get it made even yeah if, even if it didn't work yeah like you yeah were gonna get it yeah, made. yeah. Stu- and studios definitely had no faith in high high concept stuff before the no, matrix no. and then it's yeah. like you look at pulp fiction when it came out in 94 and then you look at like the all the crime dramedies that came out from 94 oh, yeah. to like 2000 because yeah uh, again it's always good to remind oneself that the movie industry is a copycat industry. Yeah, that's, yeah, that, that's what yeah. it is. Like, what made money? Let's do that. Yeah, yeah. Oh, hey, that yeah. worked. Absolutely. Yeah. And then just kind of going back to our discussion about a glitch in the Matrix mm-hmm. and some of the things that happen in there. The um, we touched a little bit on the Matrix defense. The term applied to several legal cases of a d- defense based on the Matrix films, mm-hmm. where reality is a computer generation simulation and that the real world is quite different from what reality is perceived to be. Oh, I thought I was in the Matrix when I was committing that crime. Mm-hmm. Right. I thought I was in an alternate reality. I mean, this is a real thing, you guys. Right. The yeah. Matrix defense. It, it, it can definitely be hard to grapple with, realizing that, like, oh, yeah, this culturally important touchstone of a movie affects culture in both positive mm-hmm. and negative ways. Um, because, yeah, it, it, I mean, I think one of the best examples of this is the way that, you know, the Wachowskis are, are trans women and they made the Matrix movies before they were before they had come out. And over time, obviously, have, and you can go back and rewatch the Matrix as an allegory for the trans experience. Absolutely. It's, it's about being a closeted Especially person. Especially the, the second two, even in a way, even more kind of like, like all the things you think were subtext in the first one kind of become text of that in the second. Definitely. Movies. Yeah. And, but then like, because I, I, like, I think that is a very be- beautiful thing that the, the, the fact that you can read those movies that way. Yeah. But absolutely. then also realizing that there are people who have taken the matrix and turned it into their own thing. Like the way that, Men's rights activists have taken the red pill the red to be pill that, you know, apparently if you take the red pill, you realize that 
women actually control the world and that men are the real ones who yeah. are being persecuted. Yeah, so fucking persecuted, huh? It's bad, man. Yeah. yeah. Oh, man. Isn't, it, isn't it hard being a white male? Dude, it's so hard being it's so hard being a straight white male sometimes isn't that I it? oh I cry myself to sleep on the money that I make writing about my movies. <laughs> I mean, honestly, I, I can say, as a queer person myself who is, is gender fluid and, and will often present myself as female, I also am very, very aware of the way that I can hide under my white male presenting side. Sure. And it's like, I got a lot of privilege there, and you know, it's a nice place to be. I, yeah, yeah. I don't yeah. think I'm really persecuted as a white male. Yeah, I don't, you know, I used, I was thinking about that recently. I, when I worked here at the theater years and years and years ago, I would get done working here at 10 or 11 o'clock at night, and I would walk home through Drake Park at midnight one, you know, in the morning. Mm -hmm. And not once, not one time did I ever have a single sketchy thing happen to me. And I was like, that's only because I'm big, white, and bearded. Like, it has nothing to do with Drake Park being safe. Yeah. It just, I, I got to... I'm privileged enough to look how I do, and that protected. And that no one would mess with. And me. no one messed yeah. with me exactly. Exactly. Uh, Tonda Lynn Ainsley of Hamilton, Ohio, was found not guilty by reason of insanity using the Matrix defense after shooting her landlady in the head in July of 2002. Right. right. We said we wow. weren't going to get dark here, but we <laughs> yeah, we got there. Vadim Messages of San Francisco offered a matrix explanation to police after chopping up his landlady and was declared mentally incompetent to stand trial. So the matrix defense works, is what you're saying. Joshua Cook's lawyers were going to attempt this defense in 2003 in his trial for the murder of his adoptive parents before he pleaded guilty. Okay. And that's that's who the movie, the, he's in the movie, right? Legend of the Matrix, oh, oh. that's the guy. Okay. Yes, Joshua Curtis. this is him. Uh -huh. Yeah, Joshua Cook. The case Cook. of Lee Malvo also included references to the Matrix mentioned in the writings taken from his jail cell. He reportedly shouted, free yourself from the Matrix from his cell oh. after his arrest and told FBI agents to watch the film if they wanted to understand him. Wow. Did you say that guy's name was Lee Malvo? Uh, yes, Lee Malvo. Isn't that the name of, like, legit, isn't that the name of Billy Bob Thornton's character in the first season it of Fargo? Is. It yeah. is. You're, yeah, or at least Malvo. Malvo I mean, is. This Malvo is, is. Yeah, yeah. yeah, this Yeah, this guy. Anyway, he was young. All these people were young. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it's, it's yeah, funny, yeah. too, because I, I do remember in, in the Animatrix, like, there is a character there at some point who, you know, has gone insane, and right. they talk about how they realize they're living in a simulation. And so that it's, it's interesting how the, the ideas that the matrix movies were exploring as a science fiction concept, which, which, which I, I do think are, are, are fascinating things to get into and, yeah, and, yeah. and, and, and fun to, to, to think about how, but, but, but like all media, they can, yeah, they can, people can take them literally and just, yeah, you use them as the as the scaffolding to hold up their own impressions of the world. Um, yeah, yeah. So, like, think. Let's say you're the you know you're the F, you're the, the the detective who is sitting down with this individual mm -hmm. and is like, okay, you know, what kind of movies do you like? What kind of music do you like? Right. What what right. were you listening to? What right. you know? And digging through their bedrooms and their stuff and right. their right, you know, and and going, wow, this person. Right really is into the matrix yeah, and, yeah, yeah. and video games and yeah. wow this person could be living in an alternate reality mm. or are they mentally ill right right yeah i mean i mean where's the line where do you draw the line yeah, I, I, yeah again good question. as as someone who you know grow up gr grew up wearing the clothes that weren't coded by my gender like i could have been identified as like well this this you know todd kid he's a weirdo he needs to be you know put on drugs and like yeah, if, yeah. If I was growing up in, a, in another area, uh, you know, some culture that just really rejected that idea, like I could have been put in an insane asylum, very, very possibly. I like, mean, the yeah. way that culture, or, or, or our culture, codes things, and you know, like, like, like those kids who get to like wear black nail polish in a really religious in, environment, yeah. just because of that thing, yeah. you know, cultures are cultures are afraid of yeah. the things that. That's that that mark people as others. Yeah, right, and right. it starts with the parents. You know, I said that this commercial. I don't know what the commercial is for. So someone 
jump in, but the kid is obviously goth. He's got a mohawk. He wears, mm-hmm. he's in all black. You know, he's a middle school. Mm-hmm. But he goes down to his kitchen. He gets something out of the fridge. His mom's com- mom comes over and gives him a kiss on the cheek like they're accepting of him. Mm-hmm. There's a commercial, and I don't know what it's for. I it's totally crazy. forgot, but yeah. it's like yeah. accept your kids for who right. they right. are. Well, and it's interesting, especially what you just said about, like, how we code things now. Um, if, if like, if you're on, like, this is fascinating to me. Let's, like, let's say you're on Tinder and yeah. you're clicking through photos. And you ju- you don't look at any of the writing. You just look at the photo. Mm-hmm. You're able to tell if someone is conservative, liberal. Uh, sure. Just like like if yeah. if I see a photo of a woman with a camouflage hat, yeah. she's a conservative. Yeah, I yeah, get like yeah. nine the, times out of ten. The, the educated guess is there because yeah. because we Don't are polish. starting to code ourselves yep. in a way like like. Half of the, and then you look at the, if if you look at the uh, writing underneath it, it says like what you know what they're looking for, what they're not looking for, and it, nine times out of ten now, which I didn't see this a year ago. Yeah. Nine times out of ten now, it says no Trumpers or no anti-Trumpers. Like right. like everything is kind of like we're we're specifying ourselves more and more and more and more. Yeah. Like and and now like like if I see the word patriot. Mm-hmm. I know that word 95% of the time is going to be used in a way that I do not correlate with patriotism in any way, shape, or form. Yeah, yeah. That is that it, word is yeah. becoming a, a dog whistle for shit I really don't agree with at all. People who think they're patriots are kind of not patriots in 2021 anymore. Oh, yeah. yeah. It, it, it has a subjective connotation that is no longer – uh, right, or, or, or that has outweighed its actual definition. Yeah, it's completely outweighing its actual oh. definition. And Jared, do you do, do people ever think that you're like I don't know, like the way you dress or the way you you know write or whatever? Do they uh-huh. ever put you in a box? Like, oh yeah, you only been... like weird stuff. You're only into yeah, yeah, you know, like dark or weird, you know, like yeah, I don't L- know. like kind of similar to you telling me not to get into any dark stuff in this yeah, conversation. Yeah, yeah, like, really like, you know, <laughs> yeah, no, 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 yeah, I've, oh, I always have been. Uh, uh, I am like every day, literally, literally every day on Facebook, somebody will send me a message being like, yo, uh, what do I watch tonight? I'm bored. And they're always expecting me to recommend something super weird and super screwed up. And it's like, I don't know. I just got done watching my blueberry nights. Like maybe, you can, maybe you can watch that. I don't know. Do you Nora like a little, little Nora Jones romance? Come on. Like, because they like what you like. Or I I think or, or maybe they just want to see something off the beaten path. Yeah, I think because I'm a tubby bearded fuck that people genuinely think I'm gonna be into some weird stuff, uh-huh. and because of being in the same room with me and talking to me and knowing me for 20 years, you realize I am into weird. Are you, you know what I think it is? I just think I'm I think I'm softening as I get older. I think that's what it is. Like now I'm watching Blueberry Nights, but like right, my Blueberry, right, right, but like right, right. five years ago I would have been watching Holy Mountain and being like, let's make this a drinking game. I mean, I, I get that. I, I feel like I'm I'm softening as I'm you know I'm, I'm maturing and becoming a more accepting person. Yeah, 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 yeah. But one thing I want to talk about, but like to me, this is a perfect example of how internet culture and how the Matrix really did change everything. Uh, the Matrix came out. March 31st, 1999. Three weeks later, exactly, was Columbine. And they were wearing black trench coats yes. and black boots. Yes. If that happened now, the Matrix would have been pulled from the theaters. Yeah. And nobody would ever fucking talk about that movie again. Yep. yep. But back then, I don't even remember the Matrix getting talked about in relationship to Columbine happening. And I was a senior in high school when it happened. Uh So I did go through the whole, like, oh, over the weekend, metal detectors got put in. Like, I saw that shit happen. Or you started thinking about, like, oh, my God. That kid wears a trench coat right. and black boots because right. that was a thing. Right, the right, right. The boots went yeah. with the trench coat, right? And you're right. like, oh, my God, is he going to shoot up the school? Right. You know, right. not in my high school. Right. You right. know, because, you know, bullying happened. But, you know, back then, back in the day, I will say, it yeah. was not like it is now. No, no, because no. Because of the internet and because yeah. of social media. Bullying yeah. is way more psychological now. Oh, now like, it's, it's, it's more like yeah. – like, 
I'm gonna get you to kill yourself and without when, ever touching well, you. I'm when gonna I went to school, you. when I went to school, boys fought with their hands, yeah. not with guns. They they took it outside. Yeah. They, you know, did what they had to do. They shook hands and they walked away. That yeah, does yeah. not happen anymore because so, no. of social media, because of the no. internet. But Columbine was scary. Yeah. Yeah. It was very scary. And a lot of, you know, movies, music, and TV got blamed for it. See that video game. That's what I was gonna say. Is I personally don't remember the Matrix getting blamed for Columbine. Not yet. Yet three weeks later, Mm -hmm. people dressed like Neo shot up a school, and it didn't get all the blame. I mean, I do remember, like especially when Bowling for Columbine the movie came out, it was a lot more, like that focused more on the NRA's like big, Mm -hmm. giant throbbing erection for guns more than it did pop culture influencing it like yeah michael you know. moore didn't talk about that so much i wonder you know but he did have an interview with marilyn manson in that movie where marilyn manson where somebody asked marilyn manson and he was like what would you say to those kids and marilyn manson said i wouldn't say anything i would listen and it was like oh leave it to marilyn manson to actually have kind of the most empathetic <laughs> quote in the entire film at the time right? yeah yeah at the, oh, yeah geez. at the time oh well, if people are capable of multitudes. Marilyn Mass can still have a very, you know, insightful comment and still also be a pervert. So. Yeah, 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 he can do he can do all of those. Things I am, yeah, yeah, not happy about that. All right. Uh, well, I mean, do you, do you guys feel like if, if if this happened in 2020, if The Matrix came out and three weeks later somebody dressed like Neo well, shot up a uh, school? Oh, yeah, there, there, I, th- I think the the desire for a scapegoat is much more prevalent today than it was Absolutely. 20 years ago. Right, right. Because you'd have to look at every case. I mean, look at Sandy Hook. We're st- right. They're still yeah. confused yeah. Right. about what yeah. happened in that household right. with that kid, right. you know, right, right. There, and what was going through his head and what, you know, I mean, he was a spoiled rich kid who had guns. Right, There's right. There's that really great what? Onion headline that happens every time there's a mass shooting that says, uh, nothing could have foreseen this, or, or n- n- nothing could have prepared for this. Says nation where this happens all the time. <laughs> right. Yeah. 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 Like that, exactly. It's, it, that headline is funny, but also dark. It's like, oh yeah, yeah. we just we, we keep doing this. Um, yeah. There's a, there's this movie that just came out called Spree with uh, Joe Keery from from Stranger Things. I heard about this movie. And uh, the whole movie is found footage, and it's a, a Uber driver sets up three or four GoPros in his car. And that was Sundance of last year, I think. Yeah, yeah, and just drives people around, and he doesn't get enough followers, so he starts killing his passengers. That's right. And that still doesn't increase his followers, yeah. which to me, that's the reason for that movie to exist, yeah. is just that satirical moment, is like, yeah. that didn't do shit to make, to make his... But it's like, that is kind of, I mean, it, it probably wouldn't. It, the, like in 2021, yeah, that you're right. might not make his you're followers right. go. You're right. And the world is a scary enough place for me to, enough for me to, I can't add one more thing like simulation or like mm-hmm. going into the box of the matrix or thinking that we're computers or any of that because I'm already freaked out enough. Right. I can't <laughs> go there. Right, I just right. can't go there that's yeah. fair that's fair it's a, it's a yeah. lot it's a lot to yeah we we, right. we could keep talking about we this could, and uh, we should probably you know, just wrap it up okay yeah. i mean yeah because ult- ultimately the glitch in the matrix can be about whatever you want to make it about because because to me like by the end of it i was like wow that that had a lot of mentally ill people talking about their illness in it yeah but i guarantee you when those people sat down to be interviewed that is not what the intention of their interview that they were giving was. No. Their intention was, I'm going to tell people about simulation theory. And totally. you could hear the interviewer asking them questions and right. prompting them. Right, and, right, you know, right. and, you I, know. I was reminded a lot of, like, interviews with people who go through DMT experiences and drug experiences. For sure. Like, sure. It's, for sure. It's a similar, similar thing. Like, hey, I'm just telling you my experience, but there isn't really... And I, I, yeah, again, like these people aren't experts. It's just their their first hand experience. Their, right. Yeah. Right. It's right, what they right. believe. It's yeah. yeah. So. All right, everyone. All right. Thanks. Thanks so much for listening. Um, what are we gonna talk Podcast. about next week? No idea. Oh, it's a that's surprise. how we do it here. That is, that is that's we do. We've got a few movies that are on the virtual tin pan. That yeah. We might yeah. be talking about one of those. Yeah. yeah we'll I mean, see. we will. Well, actually, again, if I record a bumper next week that I put in this episode that people have already listened to because it was in the middle, right. I might have said what we are. We watching. might have already said it. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. a really good point. Time travel. Everyone. So it'll be a surprise. 
until then. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, people listening might already know. That's it's just true. that we don't know we right don't now. Yeah, yeah, that's amazing. There All right. Those. Well, signing off, yeah. Julie Furness. I'm Todd Lizer. Jared Rassler. Talk to you next week, everybody. Bye-bye. I love you.